Geronimo Stilton, A Very Merry Christmas, read by Hosea Tong Ho. It was winter in New Mouse City, the capital of Mouse Island, with the weather outside which was frightful. Sitting at my desk one chilly evening, I gazed out my window at the snowflakes falling softly over the city. Oh, I almost forgot to introduce myself. My name is Stilton, Geronimo Stilton. I'm the publisher of the Rodents Gazette, the most famous newspaper on Mouse Island. I shivered. I put my paws on the space and heated up the table under my desk. Sometimes it felt as if winter would go on forever. <laughs> I hate cold weather, but then I remembered something that was cheering me up. Christmas was just a few days away. <sighs> Christmas, it was my favorite holiday. It reminded me of all the things I had to do. Holy jeez, my list was almost as long as Santa's. I started to decorate my mouse hole, buy last minute gifts, and figure out the holiday menu. There's so many delicious treats to eat at Christmas time. Candy canes, roasted chestnuts, toasted cheese logs, and so on. As I sat there daydreaming about the magic of Christmas, the door burst open my grandfather William Shortpaws stomped in. He shoved his snout within an inch of mine and shouted, Wake up! Are there visions of cheese puffs dancing in your head, grandson? Wake up! up I jumped out of my fur no of course not well what do you mean by visions of cheese puffs I was just thinking about the menu for Christmas dinner and cheese puffs would certainly be delicious I know it's almost Christmas but that's no excuse for daydreaming grandfather thundered Geronimo I want you to focus on business on the newspaper it doesn't run itself you know on the newspaper this paper needs a leader with new ideas, not one who naps on the job. It pointed to the plaque that hung from the board, and it said, The wise mouse wastes neither time nor cheese. Then he tapped his paw on my snout a couple of times. Knock, knock. Anybody home? He picked up the phone and called Miss Raven, one of the assistants on the staff. He boomed. Miss Raven, please send me a memo to everybody at the road because it, The wise mouse wastes neither time nor cheese. Sign it, William Short paused. I sighed. Don't get your tail in a twist. Grandfather, even if you don't sign it, everyone will know the memo comes from you. It was true. No one would be so obnoxious. Well, if I didn't pop in from time to time to see how things are going on, this paper would be as this paper would be about as successful as moldy cheese at an early rat special. Grandfather sh sniffed. Suddenly he brightened up. Oh, I almost forgot. What I came here to tell you, I had a great idea. Uh oh, that made me worry a little. You see, my grandfather was a brilliant mouse, but his ideas always seemed to get in, always seemed to get me into trouble. You had a great idea, I repeated nervously. Yes, he exclaimed. This year, the entire Stilton family was spending Christmas. He paused and gave me a sly look. I knew he was trying to make that a moment more dramatic, but the anticipation was driving me crazy. Where, Grandfather? New York? Why New York, I asked. Grandfather smiled. Because of my best friend, Cleonica MacMouse, lives in New York. I met him a long time ago when traveling around the world with the Rodents Gazette for the Rodents Gazette. Which reminds me, grandson, you should be out there sniffing our new stories instead of in here warming your tail in the cushy chair. I opened my mouth to defend myself. But before I could squeak a word, Grandfather cut me off. Well, anyway, Klondokir invited us to spend Christmas with his family. He lives in fantastic. He lives in a fantastic apartment overlooking Central Park. He waved a letter and photo under my snout. But Grandfather, we always celebrate Chris Christmas at my household in New Mouse City. I protested. It's a tradition. We've been doing it for years. Grandfather snorted. Geronimo, traditions are made to be broken. Besides, you always say that it's exciting to discover different customs and cultures and to have new experiences. I twisted my tail anxiously. He had a good point there. You're right, Grandfather, I said. But maybe we should have Christmas at my place and then we can travel. Grandfather William cut me off. Nothing doing, Geronimo. It's all arranged. The rest of my family has already agreed to go to New York. My whiskers drooped, really. I couldn't believe no one had told me. I was always the last to know about big family news. Well, of course, if everyone wants to go, then there's nothing to squeak about. 
Suddenly, the door burst open, and the entire family raced into my office. Uncle Geronimo, did you hear that? My nephew Benjamin Skilled, who has been in Christmas in New York, we're all leaving tomorrow morning. I smiled down at my favorite nephew and tried to sound enthusiastic. Yes, 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 Grandfather just told me. We'll spend Christmas in New York. It will be great. Everybody was so excited, they were all squeaking at once, happily making plans for the trip. As for myself, I started for home. That night, I went to bed early. I was depressed, you see. I was worried that I didn't organize fun Christmases at my mouse hole. That had to be the reason everyone was so excited to spend Christmas in New York. Maybe my cooking wasn't tasty enough for my family gourmets. Maybe the decorations weren't creative enough for my family artists. Maybe the gifts weren't fun enough for the family mouselings. Yes, it was all my fault. Everyone wanted to go to New York for Christmas instead of spending it at our beloved home in New Mouse City. I had been a terrible host and I had no one but myself to blame. I lay awake for a very long time, feeling miserable. Finally, I curled up into a fur and fell asleep. The entire Stilton family left for New York the next day. Everyone except me. That is, I stayed behind until two days before Christmas. I had so much work to do at the newspaper that I just couldn't tear myself away before then. Oh, my last afternoon in the office, I wished my co-workers a Merry Christmas. Then I hurried into the office, and then I hurried home to prepare for the trip. I put my best suit in my yellow suitcase, and I packed my gifts my grandfather had bought me for the Mac Mouse family. Grandson, I want to make a nice impression to the Mac Mouses, he shouted at me. So don't forget anything. I didn't. I was too scared of him to leave, be to leave anything behind. Last but not least, I attached a bright blue tag with my name and address in the suitcase. That would make it easier for me to find it when I arrived in New York. I scurried to the airport and turned my bag at the check-in counter. Je the agent took it with a smile. You can pick up your luggage in New York, Mr. Silton. No need to worry. I thanked him and headed to the gate where my planes were waiting. Half an hour later, I boarded the plane and my trip was underway. I settled into my seat and pulled out a tourist guide to New York. Then I got out a map of the seat and looked for Mac Mouse's house. After a long, bumpy flight, we finally landed at New York's Kennedy Airport. And not a moment too soon, as far as I was concerned, my paws were so cracked. I felt like I'd been stuffed inside a tin and miniature cheese snacks for ages. It was the morning. The airport was already crowded and incredibly busy. There were tons of rodents scurrying around all over the place. Some had just arrived and others were about to depart. Everyone was in a hurry to get somewhere. After waiting the long line to get to the immigration counter to have my passport stamped, I headed for the baggage claim area to retrieve my suitcase from the Mouse Air, the official airline of Mouse Island. I couldn't wait to get my bag. I was already looking forward to a nice warm bath and something cheesy to munch on at the McMaster's air apartment. I was so tired from the long flight, I felt like I was going to fall asleep with my paws. I kept yawning. Then I saw a yellow bag with a bright blue tag on the baggage carousel, and I got a second wind. I grabbed it and headed for the exit. Outside the airport, it was snowing. I hailed a taxi, then I loaded my suitcase into the trunk and gave it to the driver at the McMouse's addresses in Manhattan. Halfway into the city, I realized I didn't have my wallet on me. Holy cheese, I only had my passport and the New York City tourist guide in my pocket. I must have left my wallet in my suitcase. I asked the cab driver to pull over. He popped the trunk and I took out the yellow bag. When I opened it, it had a big surprise. Krusty Kidder Liddy. This wasn't my bag. Where were all my clothes? The Christmas gifts for the McMouses were missing. I couldn't find those gifts. I'd be if I couldn't find those gifts, I would be cheese toast. Grandfather William would make sure of it. Oh no, this isn't my bag, I cried. A crab driver shrugged. That's your problem, not mine. I want my money. But but I don't have a penny on me. My wallet is in my bag, I shrieked. Since I didn't have any money, the cabbie, cabbie demanded my beloved gold fountain pen as paid me. I didn't dare complain. He was so huge he looked like a sumo rat with massive muscles that looked even bigger than that looked even bigger than when he was mad. He snatched the pen from my paw and climbed back into the cab, slamming the door behind him. The, car, car, the cab zoomed away, leaving skid marks behind it. It wasn't until I had disappeared from sight that I realized I was stranded on the highway. 
I stood on the side of the road in the snow. I was halfway between the airport and Manhattan. I was miles from home. I was exhausted and had no money. I had a humongous bag to lug around, and it wasn't even mine. I sat at the edge of the highway. I couldn't even make a phone call because I left my cell phone inside my bag. I wanted to cry, but I stood up and, stood up and straightened my tail. There was only one thing to do. I had to get the bag to its owner and hope that he or she had my bag. It couldn't be that hard, could it? I took a better look at the bag. It was yellow, just like mine, with a bright blue tag, just like mine. The tag had a name on it, Mrs. A. Smith. More than mozzarella, Smith? That had to be the most common name in New York City. There were bound to be hundreds of Smiths inside the suitcase. There were dresses, makeup and pantyhose. They were filled with lots of books and several notebooks filled with no notes on ancient Egypt. Plus, an x-ray of a mummy. The rodent who had taken my luggage was an extopologist. That is, someone who studies ancient Egyptian civilizations. Suddenly, I heard ringing from the inside of my bag. Ring, 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 ring. I grabbed my bag and started digging through it. At the very bottom was my cell phone. Could the rodent whose bag I'd taken be accidentally calling me? There was only one way to find out. Answer the phone. Hello, this is Mrs. Smith. This is Stilton, Geronimo Stilton. Yes, this is Mrs. Smith, a female mouse voice replied. I have your bag, I informed her. Well, she probably realized that. How else could she have answered her phone? And I have yours, she chimed. I'll meet you at Colum Rat Munching Rattlesnakes. The phone had gone dead. Tears of frustration and exhaustion rolled down my snout. As you know, dear reader, I've had lots of adventures, but this was turning out to be the most unlucky one yet. After a moment or two, I wiped my eyes and I started going through Mrs. Smith's bag. I felt guilty. I never looked through other mice's things, but this was an emergency. In one of the pockets, I found something that might help me. Mrs. Smith's appointment book. This is what she had planned for the day. Hmm. When the phone cut off, Mrs. Smith said something like, Colum. She must have been saying Colum. Columbia University. She had an appointment at 10 o'clock. If I got there in time, maybe we could exchange bags. Then I'd get the Mac Mouse's Christmas gifts back, and Grandfather would never have to know what happened. Well, I was a millipede, or a mouse. I could do it. I had to. Shivering from the cold, I put on one paw in front of the other. I had to get to Manhattan. Cars whizzed by me, coming a little closer than I liked. Lawrence here seemed to drive much faster than they did in my city. In the morning fog, the yellow headlights glimmered like cat's eyes. It was terrifying. But cold and miserable as I was, I was still fascinated by what I saw around me. New York was truly an extraordinary place. The city never slept. It was in a state of constant motion. The snow had stopped. I dragged the yellow bag behind me like a stack of moldy cheesy rinds. It left a trail through the brown slush on the side of the road. I kept slipping. I couldn't. And I continued on my way. What else could I do? I considered d going to the Mac Mouse's for help. But I was too embarrassed. No way can I tell Grandfather I lost those gifts. I panted as I sta stepped into a puddle of slush. My fur will be grey and patchy before I hear the end of it. When I got to Manhattan, I looked like I'd gone poor to claw an oversized tabby. I was covered with mud from snout to shoe. It was soaked to the bone. It felt as if I hadn't slept in a week. I hadn't eaten in hours, and I didn't have a penny to my name. My map was so wet and dirty, it was falling apart. But when I looked around, I couldn't help thinking, Holy cheese! What a beautiful city! I started walking uptown. I still didn't have a cent for the subway. It was just my luck that Columbia was the northern end of Manhattan. And I was at the southern end. But when I finished the long trek, it was worth it. What a gorgeous university. Everywhere I looked, there were students bustling about. They looked so stu studious, so serious. I turned to a mouse with a fur color of ebony and said, Good morning, miss. May I ask you a question? Of course, she answered pleasantly. I'm not quite sure if I can help you, but try me. I'm a professor here. But what would you like to know? Well, I'm looking for Mrs. Smith. The professor laughed. Smith, do you realize that's the most common name in the United States? Uh, uh, yes, I answered. Tell me your first name, the professor suggested. Maybe that will help. I don't know what I confess. I only know that it starts with an A. She shook her head. Like Anna or Anastasia. How about Anita or Ada? Maybe Adelaide. Have you had any ideas how many A. Smiths there are at this university? Where are you from? I can tell you're not a New Yorker. Yes, I know it's going to be hard finding her, I mumbled. You see, 
I was at the airport and I took her bag by accident. She has my bag of all my money and my cell phone. I haven't slept or washed or eaten. It was then I started sobbing. I tried to stop myself, but I couldn't. I was just so tired. The professor took pity on me. She offered me a cup of hot cheese and pointed me to a bathroom where I could wash my poison face. Before she said goodbye, she gave me a map of New Mass City. No, not New Mass City. Before she said goodbye, she gave me a new map of the city. Good luck finding her, she said. You'll need it. I looked over Mrs. Smith's appointment book and decided to look for her at her next appointment. 11 o'clock, the Empire State Building. Unfortunately, it was nowhere near Columbia. How was I ever going to get there in time? And I had only an hour and lots of ground to cover. I walked and walked. It seemed like it could be walking forever. My paws were so cold and sore they grew numb. Just when I thought I couldn't take anything longer, I saw a skateboard peeking out of a garbage can. That gave me a brilliant idea. I put the skateboard on the ground and placed my paw to see if it would hold. Hmm, I could probably use this, I muttered. I didn't get a chance to finish my thought. Another rodent on the sidewalk accidentally bumped into me, and the next thing I knew, I was racing along like a hamster on a treadmill. I zoomed through the crowds of New York's, screaming, and everyone was screaming, Help! Get out of the way! I was whizzing down Broadway, the biggest and most famous street in all of New York. The street seemed to go on forever. At last, I came to the 34th Street. Somehow, I managed to have something to hang on with. Now, I was speeding towards 5th Avenue. I skidded to a halt. I had made it to the Empire State Building without a scratch. I tried to blend in with the crowd of the tourists going up to, ob up to the observatory. The elevator took us up and up to the 86th floor. We went so high I could feel my ears popping. Choose niblets, I hate heights. When I scurried into an observation deck, I was stunned. The view left me absolutely breathless. What a magnificent panorama of the city. Unfortunately, I didn't have time to stop and enjoy the sights. I had to look for Mrs. Smith. I saw a mouse with a green jacket and asked, excuse me, are you Mrs. Smith? She shook her snout. The next word I asked, pinch my cheek. No, I'm not Mrs. Smith. If you want to call me, then you call me my little cutie patootie. I'm sorry, Sammy. It's been a mistake. There has to be a faster way to find her. So I took a deep breath and shouted, Mrs. Smith. Everybody looked at me. I could hear them murmuring. You can tell he's not a New Yorker. A security guard, a sec a security guard grabs me by the ear and drags me downstairs. I pulled out Mrs. Smith's appointment book and looked at my watch. The next appointment was at noon in Times Square. If I hurried, I could still make it. I was too fond of my fur to set a paw on the skateboard again. Fortunately for my sore paws, Times Square was not too far from the Empire State Building. I soon found myself in a beautiful square filled with neon lights, billboards, skyscrapers, and theater marquees. Holy cheese, the square was so bright, I wish I had sunglasses. I stood for a moment, trying to catch my breath. I was right outside a fancy hotel with big glass doors. Suddenly, two boats with smart blue uniforms came rushing out as they unrolled a long red carpet. They shouted to each other, Hurry up, will you? She's coming! I tried asking, Who's she? Well, the carpet knocked me right off my paws. I found myself snapped down on the pavement as the two dormice rolled the carpet right over my back. A beautiful blonde rodent stepped out of a long, shiny limousine. Within seconds, a huge crowd had formed. That's her. It's really her. Marcelina, someone shouted. The rodent walked slowly along the red carpet, smiling and signing autographs. She was about to step on me, so I said, What's the tail? I meant my tail. But she looked behind her and saw the tail of her long, elegant gown was caught in the door of the limousine. She smiled and planted a kiss on my cheek. And she gave me the red rose she was holding. Thank you. You're my hero. In seconds, the crowd was swarming all over my, me like a pack of hungry rats at all-you-can-eat buffet. Everyone was trying to grab my nose. It's mine. I saw it first. I'm her biggest man. It's mine. It squealed. I had to protect myself. These New Yorkers were such pushy paws. So I let the two door mice roll me up in the carpet. Then took me safely into the hotel. As I scrambled out, I could hear the crowd muttering angrily. I didn't have time to worry about what was in a bunch of ratiratsi thought of me. I was on a mouse mission, but I realized it was in all confusion. I had missed my chance to find Mrs. Smith. She slices. Locating Mrs. Smith was turning out to be as easy, uh, easy as tracking down the latest Ritendo game on Christmas Eve. If I had in hope on finding her, I had to hurry to her next appointment. One o'clock at Rockefeller Center. I was late. I raced along like a hungry cat on heels. My paws ached, my back was sore, and my heart was beating so fast it sounded like one of those bongo drummers even on Times Square. So, I arrived in Rockefeller Center. Ten minutes late. Panting, I collapsed on top of Mrs. Smith's yellow bag. I had to sit down before my paws gave out. When I looked up, I saw the hugest and most fabulous mouse Christmas tree ever. It was set amongst a beautiful skating rink, a crowd of rodents of every age, 
shaven by her colour. They were all bundled in a heavy parkress and colourful hats. Mrs. Smith, are you here? I shouted to the crowd. Mrs. Smith? No one answered. I looked at my watch. It was later than I thought. Mrs. Smith was already on her way to her next appointment. Two o'clock at the American Museum of Natural History. I sighed and picked out a yellow I picked up the yellow bag. Then with my head hanging high and my tail dragging between my legs, I headed towards the museum. When I arrived I realized I had a big problem. I didn't have any money for the entrance fee. I almost cried. Right then I caught a break. Right near the museum's front door stood a cleaning cart. I had the bag behind a um behind a pie and then scrambled inside the garbage can. A few moments later a cleaning mouse weed me into the museum. I waited patiently while we clashed along. Then as soon as it was safe to stick my snout out of the bin, I took a peek outside and got the fight of my life. An enormous skull was staring at me. It was the hugest dinosaur skeleton I had ever seen. I screeched and scurried out of the garbage can. I scrambled onto the next room and raised my head to see an enormous whale that looked as if it was about to fall on top of me. I just couldn't take it anymore. Not in my weakened, hungry state, I fainted. A museum of a member of museum staff provided me with extra stinky smelling cheese. Are you okay, sir? She asked. I nodded weakly. Some nice, some mice do find our dinosaur bones and models whale a little overwhelming, she said kindly. Dinosaur bones? Model whale? Of course! This is a natural history museum after all. I should have realized they weren't real. I didn't know if I could go on. I was exhausted, but I couldn't give up now. I had to prove to myself if I didn't get those gifts back, grandfather would never forgive me. I retrieved the yellow bag and strolled out of the museum with my snout held high. I checked the time. I could still make it to the next appointment if I hurried. I hailed a taxi and offered the driver my golden watch in exchange for a ride to the Brooklyn Bridge. I step it up. I'm in a hurry, I told him. The cab driver took off like a cat burglar, fleeing the scene of a crime. Here we go, he shouted. I felt like I was trapped in a Rat Racer 3000 video game. After 10 minutes, I was as pale as death. After 20 minutes, I was as green as broccoli. After 30 minutes, I rolled down the window and lost my cheese. Thanks to the cabbie's crazy driving, we had already arrived at Brooklyn Bridge. What a magnificent sight. It was the most beautiful bridge I'd ever seen. It was easy to understand why it was so famous. As I headed towards the pedestrian path, I noticed the long steel cables supporting the bridge. It was terrifying. What if one of the support cables snaps, I thought. Getting panicky if one of those pillings crumbles. What if a hurricane comes sweeping by? I couldn't take it anymore. I screamed at the top of my lungs. Mrs. Smith, where are you? All the rodents on the bridge stared at me, disapproving me. Fortunately me, fortunately for me, a big group of tourists arrived at the exact moment. Desperate to avoid the stares at everyone around me, I hustled into the middle of their group. I was so humiliated, I turned red from the tip of my snout to the end of my tail. In fact, I think I set a new real re world record for the most embarrassing moments in a single day. Oh, how I wish I was back in my nice cozy mouse hole with a nice cup of hot cheese by my side. For once on this awful day, I had a stroke of luck. The tourists were heading towards the ferry that sailed to the Statue of Liberty. That's where Mrs. Smith was heading for, for her next appointment. But of course, I still didn't have any money to pay for my fare. All I had in my pocket was a button and an old crust of cheese. So I went to the ferry's captain, a huge rodent with paws as, as big as a cat. With a rodent with paws as big as a cat. I told him I didn't have any money for a ticket, but that I desperately needed to get to Liberty Island. The captain looked at me appraisingly. You don't, huh? Well, well, let's see what you can do. Let's see what we can do with you. The captain rubbed his paws together in anticipation. I've got it. Take that oversized mop and start scrubbing the deck. Make it shine. If I'm totally satisfied, I'll pay for your ticket to get to the Statue of Liberty. He smiled down at me. Today's your lucky day. I'll do it, I told the captain. I picked up that mop and began to swap the to, and began to swab the deck. A few moments later, I looked up from my work. There she was. The famous Lady of Liberty was emerging through the frog. When I finished cleaning the deck, it was as shiny as the top of another famous New York monument, the Chrysilla Building. The captain must have been pleased because he gave me a friendly pat on the back and almost dislocated my shoulder. This is America, young man. Go, climb the statue, and look to your future. I decided to follow his advice. I disembarked and headed towards the statue. She was even more beautiful up close. With a yellow bag in the toe, I got in line for the elevator that would take me up the base of the statue to Lady Liberty's feet. And holy cheese, that line was long. It seemed like every rodent in New York City was in line with me. I would be waiting for hours to get to an elevator to the top. Without my gold watch, I had no idea what time it was. Excuse me, do you have the time? I asked the rodent standing behind me. It's 33, she replied. It's 33, she rep No, it's 3.30, she replied. Morning, mozzarella. 
Mrs. Smith had probably come and gone. I let out a squeak. I let out, I let out a squeak of frustration. Frustration. Would I ever get to see my bag again? There's only one way to find out. I had to make it to Central Park by 4 p.m. I couldn't tell you and couldn't begin to tell you what I had to do to get back to Manhattan. First, I had to scrub the deck of the ferry again. Then I slogged along the three through the wet, heavy snow. My paws were so sore they looked like they had gone through a cheese grater. I paused on a street corner to catch my breath. I was so tired I had to use the yellow suitcase to support myself. A sanitation worker took pity on me and offered me a ride uptown on the back of his garbage truck. I couldn't afford to be choosy, so I pinched my nose and scurried on board. What a stench. I got to Central Park in time, but I smelled like a garbage can. I had to find Mrs. Smith. I just had to. Then I'd finally be able to go to McMaster's apartment and relax. I started dreaming about how my relatives would happily welcome me. I'd take a nice hot bubble bath. And I'd need some delicious warm food. Unfortunately, I was so busy daydreaming, I forgot to look where I was going. Before you could say visions of cheese puffs, I was trampled by a group of runners as they stomped on my aching tail. I heard them say, who's that? What's he doing blocking the road like that? You can tell he's not a New Yorker. I was too weary and numb to feel anything. My last thought was, holy cheese, New Yorkers are tough. They jog in the snow. Then, for the next second time of the day, I fainted. When I came to, I was all alone. It was getting dark. The past and Central Park were deserted and I had lost my last chance to find Mrs. Smith. Dejected, depressed, and despondent, I aimlessly wandered through the streets of New York City. The city looked like a fairyland with Christmas lights everywhere twinkling against a blanket of, of new snow. Rollins everywhere shouting Merry Christmas. Choirs of little mice went around singing merrily Christmas carols. It seemed like there were a rodent dressed as Santa Claus on every corner. They, ra they rang bells and bellowed. Merry Christmas, happy holidays to all. Everybody was happy, everybody except me. Everyone was hurrying home to celebrate with their families, everybody except me. Everybody had a place to go, everybody except me. I'd never felt lonely in my life. I found myself in a beautiful circle with a huge statue of Columbus as its center. At the moment I had an idea and it struck me like a lightning bolt. With new hope, I took out Mrs. A. Smith's appointment book. I looked closer at the last appointment. The one my tear had erased. What did Columbia mean? I thought it must have meant Columbia University, but could it also mean Columbus Circle, one of the most famous landmarks in Manhattan. I looked around trying to get to my bearings. Yes, this was Columbus Circle. It was one of the corners of Central Park. It suddenly dawned on me that the McMasters lived in Columbus Circle. I couldn't remember the address, but I remembered what the building looked like. I'd seen it in a photo Grandfather William had shown me. I still hated the idea of confessing my mistake to Grandfather William. A fate had brought me right to him. So what choice did I have? The only thing to do was find the McMaster's building and ask for help. I walked around and around Columbus Circle until I finally recognized the McMaster's building. It was an enormous skyscraper gleaming with shiny mirrors, glass doors and brightly lit windows. Two minutes in mouth, I pushed open the door. As it swung open, a gust of wind, wind, a gust of warm wind enveloped me. It felt so good to be in a warm place. The door mouse, a tall muscular rat, was dressed in fancy red uniform with gold air pullets on his shoulder. With an air of superiority, superior, superiority, he stuck out his snout in my face and asked, Who are you? I could barely blame him for being so scornful. I was bedraggled. I smelled like a garbage truck, but I tried to maintain my dignity nonetheless. I'm a guest of the McMouses. He stared at my soggy fur, my mud-soaked clothes, the dirty bag, and the glint of the desperation in my eyes. Then he snorted, Yeah, right. Like the likes of you. A guest of the McMouses? Surely not. I tried pleading him. Please, would you let the McMasters know I'm here? My name is Stilton. Geronimo Stilton. I come from New Mouse City. Geronimo who? He said disdainfully. Where's New Mouse City? I've never heard of it. My name is Stilton. Geronimo Stilton, I said firmly. I'm the publisher of the Rolex Gazette, the most famous newspaper on Mouse Island. The Dormouse laughed so hard he almost popped the shiny buttons off his uniform. No kidding me. Do you, the, publish of, the publisher of a newspaper? Then I'm the President of the United States. I took out my soggy business card. The writing was still readable though, barely. Would you please bugs the McMouses for me? I asked him. Thank you. He still looks suspicious, but he buzzed the McMouses. There's a scruffy rodent here who says he's Geronimo Stilton from New Mass City. He says you've been expecting him, but there was a pause, and then the doormaster's expression changed from scorn to shock. You really been expecting him, really? he asked. He looked me up and down in amazement. Well in that case, of course. The doormaster hung up on the phone, then half heartedly took off his cap and bowed. Mr. Stilton, this way, please. Take the elevator to the 34th floor. 
I dragged myself and the yellow bag to the elevator. I no longer cared about what I'd lost and the gifts. Not even though the prospect of facing my grandfather bothered me. All I cared about now was taking a nice long bubble bath and stuffing some cheese in my snout. Not necessarily in that order. I pressed the button for the 30th, 34th floor. While the elevator was going, I started thinking about what I'd say to McMouse's and my grandfather. Finally, the elevator door opened. I found myself in an immense room decorated with elegant furniture and brightly coloured Christmas decorations. It was filled with lots of smiling rodents. Among the many happy faces, there was my grandfather. I threw myself on knees before him. Grandfather, please forgive me. I lost the bag with all the McMouse's gifts. My grandfather opened his mouth to squeak. But before he could say a word, someone interrupted me. What do you mean? A pleasant sounding voice asked. The gifts are right here. A friendly looking young rodent came towards me. She was carrying a, ye- she was carrying a yellow bag just as the one just like the one I had. I still had clutched in my I still had clutched in my paw. Attached to the bag's handle was a bright blue tag that said Geronimo Stilton. It was my suitcase. It's it I started. Cheesecake, are you Mrs. A. Smith? They won't laugh. Yes, I'm Mrs. A. Smith. And you're Geronimo Stilton, right? I was almost struck speechless. Yes, I am Stilton, Geronimo Stilton, I finally answered. What are you doing at McMouse's house? I'm Annabelle McMouse Smith. I'm Annabelle McMouse Smith, Klondekur McMouse's daughter. She explained, I'm Mary Coconut Smith, a smiling rodent with dark fur approached and shook my paw. Hi, I'm Coconut Smith, Annabelle's husband. Welcome, Geronimo. We've been waiting for you since this morning. I was flabbergasted. I don't understand. What do you mean you've been waiting for me this morning? My grandfather cut in. So Dane dreaming grandson, huh? Wake up and the smell the cheddar. My friend Klondike's daughter arrived home this morning, opened the suitcase, and found it was not hers. But I recognized it immediately. It was your bag. Animal tried calling you to tell you to come to immediately to Columbus Circle. I couldn't believe it. All day long, I've been thinking I'd never find A. Smith. That Smith was too common a name, and she'd be under my snout the whole time. Too bad the phone battery went dead and you never got the full message, my grandfather went on. We've been waiting for you all day. You got here just in time for Christmas Eve dinner, but your appointment book had gone someplace different every hour. Why was your schedule so packed, I asked Annabelle. She smiled. I thought I'd take you around New York and show you some of the most interesting sights, but it looks like you've already done that by yourself. I guess I had. I wouldn't necessarily recommend my way to other sto- tourists, but I'd certainly seen the city from the top to bottom. And now that I was nice and warm with family and friends again, I could almost laugh about it. Almost. It certainly had been an adventure. While the Stiltons and the McMasters were still celebrating Christmas, I gazed out in the enormous picture window overlooking Central Park. The snows covered trees seemed to go on forever. It was a magical sight. Fluffy flakes danced through the air and settled gently on the newly fallen snow. The snowflakes reminded me of home. The snow that fell on New York was the same as the snow falling over New Mouse City. It just goes to show that things that really matter are the same everywhere. All over the world, the heart of every mouse asks for the same thing. Happiness. I turned back towards the rodents in the room. There was nothing that could make me happier than I was at this moment. With my family and friends around me, stretching out my arms, I called out, Merry Christmas to all of you. I turned McMouse's, Thank you for including me in your holiday celebration. It's wonderful to make such a marvellous new friends. Then I turned to my family. And it's marvellous to be back with my family. It wouldn't be Christmas if I couldn't all be together with you guys. I love you all. My sister, Benjamin, rushed over and gave me a big hug. Even my grandfather came over to embrace me. Holy cheese, this was turning out to be one of the best Christmas ever.